it looks like we have uh, 40 plus attendees, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, wanted to uh, first of all welcome everybody and uh, give folks a sense of the agenda for today's event. Um, it will be uh, we scheduled 90 minutes, and it is somewhat structured, but we have lots of opportunity for questions and answers and interaction, uh, both during the presentations and at the end. So one thing I want to highlight, uh, for those that have not used GoToWebinar before, there is a question section in the uh, little strip that it brings up on your screen. So in the lower right, you'll see questions there. We are uh, going to be answering those questions uh, pretty much as they pop up uh, in the text box. And if they are uh, something that we can highlight in the actual presentations, we'll probably have the presenters take a minute and talk about them. So um, I think uh, as much as possible, we look forward to those questions and you know, fire them off early and often, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to field them. We've also actually dedicated a chunk of time uh, at the end of the session specifically for Q&A, because uh, the topic of, of high-speed networking is, uh, is a, a deep one and a rich one. And I'm sure there are going to be uh, lots of areas for discussion. So um, I'm one of our two presenters today. The other is Corky. Uh, Corky is on the line. Hello, everybody. And uh, so I think we're going to we're going to try and keep things fairly uh, uh, fairly. Uh, Structured, so we've got uh, basically just introductions right now for a minute or two. We'll talk about the plan, then uh, Corky will dive in with 20 minutes about Small Tree, who are leaders in 10 gigabit networking in the creative space. Uh, and uh, as you'll see from the history, they've been doing this a while and have uh, tremendous expertise both at the device level and the applications level uh, for for high speed networking. Then we're going to spend 20 minutes on Axle Video and uh, a bit on how our products kind of uh, uh, relate. We're going to spend uh, 10 minutes on hardware configurations for running Axle because that relates back to the networking question of what kind of cards and adapters uh, you're, you're going to need. Uh, at, at the one hour point, we're going to have a more application-centered discussion about uh, how 10 gigabit compares with other network protocols, and also uh, when it, when best to use it, and how best to use it. And then, as I mentioned, the last 15 minutes of, of the presentation are open for, for questions and answers. So I just wanted to start out by, by grabbing a couple of sort of big picture uh, data points for people. Uh, this is uh, something from uh, the folks at Netgear who, who uh, do very affordable uh, gigi switches and and they uh, came up with these numbers why people are going to 10 gigabit um, about 40 percent of the people are doing it uh, because they, they need to solve network bottlenecks and that makes total sense obviously in our space this is across wider industry it's not just for the media space um, and then uh, about a third of them are doing it to to handle expansion um, and in, in the case of Netgear, I think they're probably talking more about expansion in terms of number of one gigabit clients uh, talking to the backbone network. Um, that is also a, a driving factor in media and entertainment. But what we often see is, you know, five, ten person shops that will have 10 gigabit all the way down to, to the desktop because they're editing 4K or they're doing high throughput work. And one gigabit is, is already uh, stretched to its limit to handle the network traffic. Uh, for whatever combination of reasons, 10 gigabit is now becoming mainstream. It's been a few years now since uh, the standard was set. Uh, there are a number of connector standards and wiring standards for 10 gig E. And actually, uh, Corky and I will be able to get into discussing that a bit later as well. Um, but suffice to say that it, it runs over very standard, you know, category 6, 6E network cabling nowadays. There are reasons to run it over other connectors such as distance and uh, and sort of top end reliability. Uh, but for the most part you can you can just run cables to it exactly as you would for gigabit Ethernet. 
and uh, the performance improvements are, are tremendous. Not exactly 10 times because, of course, while the wiring is capable of doing 10 gigabits, the, uh, the computers are always only approaching those numbers, but still many times faster than what you can get over a 1 gigabit network. And the real driving reason that we see for 10 gigabit is, is what this slide points out. This is Mark Zuckerberg at this year's uh, Facebook conference. And the point that he was making for their audience is that this is the year of video. Uh, and it's not just true for Facebook, although Facebook Live and such things are, are making a big impact. It, it's true for everybody. So whether it's corporate video, churches, uh, you know, not pro not for profits, universities, broadcasters, everybody's having to handle a lot more and a lot a higher resolution video than they did in the past. And that is directly driving the need uh, for 10 gigabit now. This is the recent history, for instance, of, um, of storage requirements for, for, uh, for video specifically. And uh, the numbers, I, I didn't include the numbers on the left hand because they're, they're subject to some uh, debate. But what's clear is that something like 100 exabytes of storage went in this year uh, into, in, into simply media applications, 100 exabytes. So that's 100,000 petabytes. Um, just really staggering numbers, um, and of course each petabyte is is a thousand terabytes, so basically a hundred million terabytes. And all that data doesn't just sit there. People start editing it, they start archiving it, they ingest it, then they migrate it, and every time they do that, it hits the network. So, hence the need for ten gigabit. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Corky, and we will make him the presenter. Um, and uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm fumbling with the uh, clicks here. It's not. Oh, here we go. Okay, you should get the dialogue on your desktop. Uh, I've got it. Great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Um, I'm going to spend a little time today talking about uh, Small Tree, our history, the products that we've been bringing to the market, and most importantly, how well we integrate with Axel's uh, digital asset management software products and why that integration is important to you. So, you know, boilerplate mission statement. Small tree. By the way, congratulations, congratulations on having a more crowded desktop than I do. We're still looking <laughs> at your desktop, so so uh, we, I, I don't know if you can bring the PowerPoint uh, to the front. How about that? There you go. All right. So apologize. Yeah, and I I do have a very crowded desktop. It's a reflection <laughs> of my mind. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, you well, only so, beat me by a little bit, by the way. But that, that. Okay. So I apologize for the technical difficulty. I'm not a huge webinar, webinar guy, so uh, I'm doing a little of this by fire. Uh, so uh, back again to our mission statement, uh, which is to develop simple, powerful, and affordable shared storage and networking solutions for folks like you. Um, we've, been, we've been really focusing in on this over the last... Uh, five or six years um, as we see this is really the critical need uh, to try and allow uh, the creative folks to do their job better and not be hung up so much on trying to be an IT guy although a lot of you guys in the smaller shops end up having to do exactly that so let me uh, kind of go through the small tree history we were uh, founded in uh, 2003 by five Cray and SGI high performance computing engineers, uh, in case you don't know what that acronym is, and unfortunately if you know me, you know I'm very acronym heavy. Um, so we brought our supercomputer expertise into the, into the market, and Smalltree had targeted the Apple market um, based on the G5 platform, because at that time we determined that Apple had developed a system that really was robust enough finally to to start to get to the point of doing what we consider real work and of course 
we're snobs because we come out of the HPC industry. But uh, the G5 um, created the opportunity for us to uh, try and uh, bring our expertise to the networking market for the Apple for the Apple space. So we started out by shipping multi-port copper gigabit Ethernet cards in 2004. And what was significant with about that was G5s originally only had one Ethernet port. And so they were limited in what they could do, and they were limited in um, the amount of performance that they could drive to um, for their customers. And so, you know, multi-port ends up being important but that really became more important because Apple initially back in the early days didn't have link aggregation. The nice thing about link aggregation is it allows you to get multiple conversations going off of your platform in the server environment, which is how you can start to get more bandwidth uh, to your solution and uh, away you go. So we, we started out doing multi-port and then we did link aggregation and when we did link aggregation, we did it in 10.2. Uh, that's important because we were doing it ahead of Apple. Apple actually said they didn't want to try and do it in, with OS 10.2, and they did, introduced it in 10.3. So if you work, if you work with Apple long enough, you find out that you're you're trying to create value add at the same time they're going to create value add, and then they offer it for free. So you have to work on something new. So doing that, we we continue to add more add to the product depth of gigabit Ethernet and then we then we started adding 10 gigabit when that became available and and then we added switches and the reason for doing all of that was we had customers that were asking us hey I really appreciate that you have um, provided some additional uh, um, Ethernet or networking bandwidth but you know what switch should we use and you know which one of this are you going to guarantee that this this switch that you're recommending works with the Ethernet that you're suggesting. And so we we're kind of dragged into that, uh, trying to provide a better solution for our customers. Um, I guess you could say we, we, we didn't think ahead enough. So we, we added 10 gigabit. Uh, actually, we started doing 10 gigabit back in uh, 2005. And that was way ahead of, uh, I mean, way ahead of the curve. Um, I've got cute stories I'll save for later about just how neat that is. Um, but uh, a 10 gigabit card in 2005 was uh, $5,000, and I had a nice experience at uh, at uh, one of the uh, Mac Worlds where I told someone I could provide 10 gigabits capability on their desktop, and they wanted to know how much it was. It was $5,000. They said, "You know, I think I'll just go buy another computer," uh, which was my first indication that uh, this is, um, you know, probably not ready for the masses yet, but we were trying to indicate to everybody that we were a technology leader in the space and uh, we got Apple's attention by doing that. They were pretty excited about that. And then over the years uh, we've just made sure that people are aware that we we've expanded and added uh, you know that our, our networking solutions are will support both Windows and uh, Linux solutions and so in the post-production environments we're able to provide a mixed environment support so um, we are now highlighting that a little bit more than we have in the past. So we believe that Small Tree provides the most complete suite of networking products for OS X, um, and we include support for Thunderbolt. And our goal is to be basically to provide the one one-stop shop for everyone, as I as I mentioned before, and to support multiple client environments. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you want to be, you know, as a lot of you folks have window boxes for certain uh, applications, OS 10 boxes for other things and how you like. And we're trying to ensure that we just can allow you to think of Small Tree as your connectivity solution opportunity. So here's a here, here's a kind of the, the list of our our product depth. We provide single and 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, solutions in a single, a two, four, and six port um, solution depending upon your requirements. Um, we provide copper, optical, and direct attach support for any kind of environment that you may have. 
And we also provide single and dual port copper and optical Thunderbolt connectivity. And as those of you who are paying attention in OS X land, Apple's decided that that's the way they want to do things. And uh, while I think there's both good and bad in that, I mean, I think it allows them to uh, make, make some of their design decisions better. Uh, part of the problem is that it, it, it puts a burden on a lot of folks because it's really tough to do uh, true shared environment work um, <laughs> over a Thunderbolt uh, protocol, which is not really a networking protocol at all. It's more of a local attach protocol. So it, uh, it's just something we work around. So we, we've, we're supporting the industry by providing um, Thunderbolt connectivity. Um, most people don't know that the solutions that you can get from some of the vendors that are showing uh, uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet to Thunderbolt connectivity uh, conversions, they're actually using small tree uh, software. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that, that every now and then you'll find a bit of so small tree software that's embedded in OS 10 based upon some of the work that we've done in the past. Um, I put together a slide here showing you some of the customers that we work with. Now this is kind of my flashy slide, uh, big name clients. <clears throat> I do this to let people know that really large companies who have lots and lots of money to spend and test and verify that what they're about to put in their network, which ends up being at the heart of everything that they do, uh, they trust Smalltree. And so, you know, one of my points that I'd like to make to uh, the smaller uh, customers that we have and post houses is that. We recognize that any investment that you're going to make with small tree is, you know, is a big deal to you. And uh, just because, uh, you know, $2,000 in networking upgrades uh, might not seem like a lot of money, small tree is very focused on having partners and partnerships with our customers that go over the years. Um, in fact, many of our customers are repeat customers. And uh, we pride ourselves on that, which kind of ties into uh, something I'll bring up in a little bit, which is our support. Um, we also have support in, uh, you know, not public sector, but in the governmental sector. And while this is important um, to recognize that uh, these folks are fairly serious about um, the partners that they work with and the customers that are the solution providers that they'll accept and so there's a stringent requirement here and, and we satisfy those folks and have been working with those folks and in fact um, uh, not totally related but um, to this discussion a small tree has done government contract work um, in the past um, so let me talk a little bit about small tree support um, we use a tagline that our support is legendary. Uh, you can go on the internet and you'll find stories about how we will work with customers to resolve their problems. If, if you're a networking company and you're, and you're providing networking solutions, you, it's pretty hard to get away from the fact that if it's not working, the customer who just bought one of your products is going to come to you and say, well, it was sort of working before you guys got in there and, and now it doesn't seem to be working. And so we, we basically take that on as a challenge. Um, we have many, many times gone in and found problems um, out of sight with the customer's client machine that has nothing to do with our product, uh, but our product has basically highlighted the problem that they had, and we fix that. Um, we, and and we, we actually enjoy doing that because there's nothing better than making a happy customer more happy. And so it's... I have many war stories about how we've gone in and made made a problem that a customer's been fighting go away as part of ensuring that they're getting the best possible results from our product. And we, you know, you call us and we're there and we answer the phone. Uh, you don't go into a bank and it's not a bug that gets filed and it may or may not be used, um, um, uh, you know, that someone will actually work on it, that someone will get to it. We. I can I can promise you that if you call us with a problem that we can verify, we're working on it 
uh, from the time we, we uh, recognize the problem. So it's been a little dry going through the text, but I wanted just to pop up a few uh, images of uh, our 10 gigabit networking cards. And you know, Sam alluded to 10 gigabit. Um, so we also have gigabit for, for those customers that uh, still have some of those legacy machines. But um, this is just showing you some of the products and the cover, the range here of uh, from a single port to a six port card uh, showing copper, optical, and direct attach. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with direct attach, that is kind of like Thunderbolt in the sense that it's, uh, you know, a 10, a 10 foot connectivity um, between uh, your server and your, uh, your client machine, and it ends up saving you some dollars um, over, um, over optical or, or, or copper because you don't have to have quite so much uh, in the amplifying of the connection. Um, one thing I'll point out here is on the um, copper solutions, you'll see a fairly intense amount of heat sinks compared to the opticals. And that's because the copper protocol on 10 gig requires a lot of power. And in fact, the reason you didn't see multi-port 10 gigabit cards for a while was they were the, the designers are having a very hard time of being able to uh, meet the, the PCI spec of only 25 watts per slot. And you know, people customers customers want what they want, and you don't want to have to have a, a dual slot solution. So it just wasn't it's not acceptable in the marketplace. So you're going to put in your network cards. You want it to take up one slot in your box, and uh, you want to support as many connections as you can there. So it wasn't until the second generation uh, silicon from from the vendors before you're able to get to um, a quad port 10 gigabit copper card. Um, and not a lot of folks have that. So if you're looking for a real high bandwidth at 10 gig in a uh, media that you understand, uh, you know, think about small tree. We can hook you up. Also, um, Sam suggested that I remind everybody that Smalltree also sells um, our, our own shared storage. Um, and we, we got into this uh, business a little bit uh, backhanded. I mean, we, we started out and we clearly were networking experts, but uh, we discovered that um, back in 2009 when everybody was told they had to buy XSAN or fiber channel based solutions, that if you were really good at Ethernet, uh, you could actually do shared shared storage over an Ethernet connection, and you can do it. You could do it for you know significantly less money than what uh, fiber channel based uh, solutions were costing. Um, so we like and we, we went down this path um, because I kept hearing comments like, "How much does your network adapter cost?" And I tell them a thousand dollars, and people would be just really upset at uh, that. Um, and but they were okay at spending thirty or forty thousand dollars on disk drives, which was kind of hard to hear as a networking engineer because without networking, the disk drive is nothing more than a doorstop. Uh, uh, okay, that's a little bit biased on my part, but my point is that uh, you know nothing goes better unless the network is going better. And so the we added this to our product line to let our customers know that we can control the data, have an integrated solution from the from the connector to the head of the drive, and it's, uh, again, one-stop shopping. And uh, because we control all the points along the way, that we have a highly tuned solution that we think is very competitive and uh, a price very well in the marketplace. And uh, that's the way, um, that's, that's what I had for our initial presentation. Uh, if there's a... Uh, I'm ready to turn it back over to Sam and uh, move forward. Actually, Corky, we've had some really good questions during your talk, so I just thought I would uh, give you a couple of them, um, and I've been doing my best to answer them uh, in the background. One of them, uh, and this one was from uh, James Sullivan, is where do you see things going with, with Mac OS? Uh, not only Sierra, but beyond. Is Apple making things easier or more difficult for you? <laughs> That's a loaded question, but go uh, ahead. <clears throat> How many of you guys are working for Apple and are just trying to see if I can hang myself? Um, here, let me get a sip. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> great question. Uh, I'll give you a couple of philosophy standpoints. Thunderbolt is a really cool uh, technology, 
and it makes certain things easier. Um, but if you want to do stuff in a shared storage environment, it doesn't make anything easier. Um, some of you may know uh, that uh, Thunderbolt is, as I mentioned earlier, was is kind of a it's a local area network. It's not addressable, and it's not really a shared storage environment. Some vendors are trying to do that, um, but it doesn't really do the things you want to do. Um, so to the customer, to the question, OS 10 and OS 10 Sierra, we our drivers are up to date for OS 10 Sierra. Uh, we we didn't find any any new issues moving moving to Sierra. Um, the the problem that I see is I don't see Apple moving away from their plan to use Thunderbolt because they've kind of invested a whole lot of their mind share as this is a way to go. Um, in for customer or companies like Smalltree, they've kind of taken a problem and pushed it on us. And Apple tends to do that. You know, they, you know, you, you look at the latest Apple Apple product offering and it has very little connectivity. Um, everything's got to be Thunderbolt desk. And and for those of you who are trying to push real bandwidth, that's really not what you want to do. Um, uh, we've noticed some of our customers have been moving to Windows solutions, uh, and we've noticed kind of a, a revival for the old cheese grater um, Apple systems because you can put in a, a 10 gigabit uh, card there and get uh, full bandwidth out of that. Um, and so <laughs> my, my belief for the, the future is we, we know how to work around Apple's uh, decisions. Um, it might not be optimized to be the best solution. You might want to consider um, a Windows-based client, given how people seem to think that Windows 10 finally got it right. What's the next question you got for me, Sam? The other question is, uh, any plan migrations or offerings in 25 and 40 gigabit? Yes. Yes, we have plans. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yes, we can't sell them yet today because we're not quite ready. Um, and it's you know it's been really interesting watching what the marketplace has been doing there. I mean, uh, you would think I'm I'm on top of all this stuff, but someone asked me, oh, so what's your plans for 25 and 50 you know gigabit Ethernet? And I'm going, well, who's doing that? You know, and so I had to kind of you know scramble and I go, oh, all right. So then you start digging a little bit more to figure out well how did this all come about and it's kind of it's kind of convenience things as to you know Ethernet protocols are you know been 1, 10, 40, 100 uh, but then you have the InfiniBand industry who's kind of been doing things and then you had ways of saying well how are you going to generate new silicon to get where you want and all of a sudden the silicon guys who are generating all this new, uh, new and greatest uh, networking technology came back and said you know, we can do things this way and come up with 25 and 50, and you know those things sort of drop in and map up really well with some of the bandwidths that you're trying to, uh, you know, get speeds and feeds to line with. So, Small Tree is working on that right now, but I don't like talking about something I can't sell. At least my sales team gets really upset about that. So I think uh, to the question is: Is Small Tree planning on being able to support? Uh, 25 and 50 uh, gigabit Ethernet in the future? The answer to that is yes, and not too far away. And um, and we see that as uh, being uh, the next step of uh, ensuring that we get bandwidth. Now, you know, there's like I said, the you know, there's a lot of things that have to happen. You know, I've got my guys telling me things like. Uh, well, 40 gigabit Ethernet, but how are you driving that if you're using just purely rotational solutions? And they go, well, you can't drive that at full, but, you know, there's a lot of interest going on in the shared storage market uh, to be you do the, doing SSDs. And then again, you know, things have been, it, it's really hard on vendors uh, to, to try and make a solution that works for everybody because, um, you know, typical video environments uh, in shared storage want to have large block files and you, you tune your systems to go in one direction. But, you know, if you want to do, um, you know, resolve type work and they have all the little DXP files and, uh, you know, those are tiny and now you move back to an IOPS model and, you know, there's, and so I think people out there are looking at ways that uh, uh, SSDs can enhance and be able to do both types of environments effectively. And once you go down that path, then you're able to 
you know, completely match up and uh, uh, so sustain throughputs for the, you know, 25, 50, 56, and uh, larger gigabit Ethernet uh, protocols that um, are coming into vote. Yeah, if anything, there's probably too many of them. Like, it, uh, it would have been much cleaner if it just went from 10 to 40 to 100. But, but like you said, from the infinite band side, now you've got the 25 and the 50. And w what's often happened in the past is that that kind of clutter will slow down um, economies of scale because some vendors will pick one, some vendors will pick another. Then you have all the, all the questions about the connectors and the SFPs and the, you know, you know how it goes. So it, there's a little of that in 10 gigabit anyway. Like in, in one gigabit, you pretty much have the copper and the fiber. But now in one gigabit, uh, there's sort of flavors of each. And you've got, I mean, whenever we order, I, I will say for the audience, when you're ordering 10 gigabit, make very sure that you understand what connectors you have at both ends. The simplest, the most straightforward thing, if you don't need long distances, is just to go with, with category 6E cabling and to just do the, the copper thing at both ends. But sometimes in an IT department, they'll have longer runs, so they'll want to go between buildings. And then you need to look into fiber, you need to look into the SFP connectors, and it is, it is very easy to pick wrong and end up with something where you can't get from here to there. You buy your switch with SFPs, and you, and you buy your, your cards with, with copper, and then you're trying to find copper to SFP adapters, which exist, but it's like, you know, that, that, we won't, we're not going to delve into great detail on that now, maybe at the end of the of the time, if there's time, we can talk a little bit about that. But that's the one thing to be aware of. Try and stay with copper, I would say. Uh, you know, unless there's technical reasons, if you need the absolute maximum throughput, uh, there are reasons to go with uh, with fancier stuff. So, so Corky, actually, there are a bunch more questions queued up for you, uh, yeah, including like where where to buy uh, stuff in 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 the Dubai and stuff. So, um, so why yeah, don't go ahead? Why don't you go ahead and go ahead and try and uh, hit some of those from the keyboard. I'll give my presentation, and then we'll circle back and, uh, and do yeah. more Q&A at the end. OK, uh, I'll, I'll, respond, uh, I'll respond to some of your questions here. Uh, thanks for all the questions. I see a couple that uh, we hadn't touched on, so I'll, I'll go through and try and respond to all of these. Yeah, and uh, I, I answered like the first half dozen. So. Well, there was one about Thunderbolt 3 that we didn't talk about, and I probably need oh, to get to. fair enough. All right, we'll get to that one at the end, then. That's good. All right, guys. So I'll, uh, if I haven't answered your, I'll try and go through these questions. I'll answer them, and uh, and uh, if if you don't get an answer, uh, you know, call me out and say, hey, answer my question. <laughs> the other thing is, we are going to be giving our, our emails and phone numbers at the end of this. Uh, both Corky and I are, are really good on just direct access. You know, it's not like uh, uh, call our distributor or something like that. Uh, so. We're very happy to extend, uh, given the level of interest and inquiries, we're, we're very happy to extend uh, this past the uh, end time of this webinar, no problem. So, okay, can everybody see my screen? I assume so. I'm the presenter, so I'm just going to go ahead here. Um, basically, Axel was founded four years ago to solve this basic question, you know, where is the clip? Uh, and our customers come at it from a number of different points of view. This is a, a photograph from an actual uh, post house in LA uh, that I visited, and, and they opened their closet and showed me this. And this is not uncommon. I'm, I'm sure many of you have something like this in your closet. The big question is, of course, how you consolidate this on some kind of central network storage. And then once you've done that, how do you find stuff? Because the finder and, and spotlight don't really work well across the network. Uh, Apple has kind of reined in spotlight over the last few years, and it just works on your local hard drives for the most part. So um, what our tool gets used for is just finding clips in large shared storage. And then we've obviously gone well beyond that by doing things like creating H.264 proxies, subclipping, uh, a variety of functions that really let you collaborate with the media, not just find it. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about our product offerings. Uh, first of all, our, our newest kind of price point is Axel Starter. And what's cool here is that we've been able to bring essentially a broad range of media management capabilities to the market for $495. Uh, and it, it, it basically gives you a couple of users, a browser interface, um, and it doesn't disrupt your current workflow. So 
our guiding principle with the software is that we don't want people to have to change how they work. And if they have a folder structure on their storage, we want them to keep using that folder structure. What we don't want to be is mission critical in the sense that a traditional MAM is. So if you look at a, um, a heavy duty MAM like, uh, like uh, Avid Interplay or Delet or CatDB, they typically sit between you and your storage and try and manage everything for you. The problem is that you've got to change everything that you're doing in order to, to basically uh, take on that workflow. And with Axel, we wanted to do none of that. We basically said, if you've got a workflow with your editors, uh, with, your, with your colorists, with, with your effects people, that's the workflow you should continue to have. And if you have a folder structure with those people, we don't want to change that either. So Axel does all those things, and it just sits on the network and watches the storage and basically gives you the ability to catalog that storage and, and really uh, turn it into, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, kind of a, a live interface for the browser front end. So um, with Axel Starter, we've been able to take a lot of the technology and make it very affordable. Um, it, it's a multi-language system, so you're able to for instance, uh, work with up to 300,000 assets. Uh, Axel makes proxies of all those assets. Um, we have custom metadata fields so you can annotate and tag things. Uh, it supports a wide range of media files, not just video, but also uh, image files, audio, even PDFs. For instance, Axel supports a multi-page PDF. So you can have um, a very simple multi-page PDF workflow and you can have documentation, for instance, or uh, other um, uh, kind of agree, you know, client agreements, uh, scripts, things like that, uh, supported. And there really is no file type that Axel can't work with in some way because when we catalog the file system, if if we can't recognize the file, we're just going to make a generic icon for it. Uh, there's no notion of check in or check out or like we don't allow this file type. Um, and if it's a generic file icon, you can always come back and tag it with metadata. What won't happen is you won't have the full uh, previewing and HT64 proxy viewing that you would with an asset that Axel is, is able to, to preview. This is what the user interface looks like. This is on an iPad. Um, this is what it looks like on, on a Mac and, and on an iPhone. We also have an Android uh, front end that runs on Android phones and tablets. So the intent here is that really from any device, anywhere in your network. Uh, you can log in, search, uh, subclip, preview, uh, approve, annotate, and just generally collaborate uh, around that storage. Now, a step up from Axel Starter is, is our kind of more mainstream Axel 2016 product. Uh, we are just now rolling out our third release of the year. We now handle well over a million assets, and we, even though our guideline is, is about a million, we have some customers uh, at 1.5 and even getting close to 2 million assets now. Um, the the, the Axel 2016.3 version also includes uh, our CAM ingest module that takes in uh, a variety of Sony, uh, Panasonic, GoPro, and, and Canon formats, and basically clean them up and rewrap them so that they're easier to work with. As most of you know, if you, if you shoot uh, with one of these cameras, you end up with this really uh, complex folder structure where you have folders within folders within folders. You can dig around and the audio file someplace else. So Axel Cam tries to clean that up. Uh, the reason we developed it is we had a number of customers that were using our software as intended to really just catalog storage, but because they were just bringing in um, uh, their, their raw camera footage right onto the storage, it was a mess. And uh, so this is the one case where we actually do uh, modify the files a little bit, but we also create a separate archival copy of the original files uh, while we're doing that. Axel 2016 also adds upload and download capabilities through the browser, so that if you're at a remote site and VP VPNing into your, uh, to your uh, working network, uh, you can grab a few files or upload a few um, that you happen to have shot in the field. There are custom logos in the user interface, so you can use it with your clients. Uh, this is typically for post houses where, you know, the, the old example of Coke and Pepsi, right? I'm a post house. I want Coke to log in and see the Coke logo. 
I want Pepsi to log in and see the Pepsi logo. And and one thing is all of all of our software gives you very tight control over the permissions. So you can very narrowly define what each user can see down to the folder level and also what permissions they're going to have on that folder. So for some users, you can say, well, I want them to be able to upload and approve, but not edit the metadata. For others, you might want to give them a much wider range of capabilities. And uh, Axel 2016 can also be expanded with things like uh, uh, transcoding, archiving, and baseband ingest. So we have some really good partners in those areas uh, that provide modules. I think from the archiving side, it's uh, Archiware and Zen Data. Uh, for baseband ingest, we work with people like Softron, uh, Cinedec, and Mog. And in each of these cases, there's a nice integration uh, that feeds into our metadata and doesn't just use the file system. Uh, the file system integration is, is pretty much there for the taking, but, but as just one example, with Softron, we can now show a preview of a Softron ingest while it's happening inside the actual interface. And we will capture any metadata that you tag that with uh, at the time that the, that the clip is complete and brought in uh, to the file system. So, you know, you've got very affordable uh, modular Mac-based ingest software. And then they're sort of handing us um, a combination of the metadata and proxy so that it, availability is almost instant uh, when it hits the shared storage. It's really cool. So this is just one example of the kinds of workflows that you can build out uh, with our software. Um, you know, typically there are network clients. Um, there's typically main storage, and here I've shown the, the small tree titanium NAS. There's often archival storage like LTO. Um, driven by either Archiware and data. Oftentimes we'll recommend a small um, utility NAS just to hold the proxy files. Uh, the reason we do this and don't recommend putting it on the main storage is that a lot of those accesses can be kind of flotsam and jetsam, very small, uh, one megabit proxies. So if you've got people doing, you know, heavy 4K or HD editing on the NAS, you would hate to have the hard drive head skipping around you know, every few milliseconds to go get another uh, frame or two of the uh, streaming proxy. So it's cheap enough and easy enough to just put that on the low-cost NAS that we generally recommend that. And then uh, there are a couple of core questions like, how is your network going to be configured? This comes to the 10 gigabit question. And then also, what kind of Macs are you going to have uh, running the Axel software? So who uses the software today? It's a pretty wide range of folks. We have 370 customers worldwide, and that number, as you'd imagine, is growing every week. Um, this is a very small partial list, but it, it includes some really big name folks. And one thing I want to emphasize is that Axel is, even though it's a, a small system and designed to be very lightweight, we have found that many of the best uses are in very high profile applications where they're going to be basically doing work and then um, need, need very high throughput on it, uh, but in, in a specific area. So it's not a replacement for an enterprise system, but it's like an ingest work group or a, a, an intense editing work group or a quick turnaround web work group. Um, NBC Universal, for instance, uses it for their web promos. CBS News uses it for their um, satellite ingests that go into some shared storage. And it's not covered by their main enterprise system. Uh, very similar situations at a number of our other customers. They may have bigger systems. They may have more traditional legacy systems. But for the, the newer systems where the, where the heavy work is getting done, Axel is really uh, the right solution. And because we don't get in their way, very often it just sits on top of an existing shared storage workflow. So they just worry about getting the network right, getting the storage right, making the use, make sure the users have good workstations and applications, and then Axel sits on top of that and gives them the browser view. I think we're going to skip a demo. We've got so many questions for today. If we do a demo, it'll be at the end. Uh, maybe a little uh, light demo of Axel if there are questions about that. But many of you are probably familiar with how the software works. Uh, Feel free to use the question section to say whether you prefer to have a demo, like I said, uh, to probably devote five or ten minutes at the end if, if we are uh, out of questions. 
And by the way, there are plenty of demos on our website. If you go to axelvideo.com, uh, there are lots of demos of different components of the system. Um, we're, we're very excited, for instance, about our, our new uh, Premiere panel. So from within Premiere Pro, you can search Axel directly. You can uh, bring up the results of searches. You can bring up bins that have been specified uh, by other folks on the team, and then basically uh, go to work on those directly in the editor. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes here before uh, going to the discussion section talking about hardware configurations, like what do you need to run Axel? Uh, and, and that will lead logically into the question of networking. So when Axel first came out, we recommended uh, a, a configuration with two Mac minis. And uh, that was actually a pretty great setup at very low cost. Uh, the only problem here is that Apple no longer makes quad-core Mac minis. Uh, you can get Mac minis, and they're nice and fast, but they only have dual core. And for the purposes of running our software, you really need quad-core. And ideally, two machines, uh, one to run the database and web serving, and one to do the transcoding. Uh, what's happened is, since that time, more and more people are putting our software in Mac Pros instead that will have 8 or 12 cores on a single machine. But you can still get the Mac minis with the four cores, and uh, you know, they're about a thousand bucks on eBay, and it's not a bad way to get started with our software. Um, speaking of refurbished, uh, you know, I think as Corky pointed out, the, the original cheese grater Mac Pros are still awesome machines, especially because Axel doesn't make heavy use of GPUs. The, the GPUs tend to be a little out of date, but the CPUs, the Xeon cores, are actually just as fast and occasionally faster than what you can get on today's Mac Pros. So, you know, at the price, again, these are widely available. Most post houses that I visit will have a few sitting in the corner because the editors have usually upgraded to the newer trash can style. And that means that they'll have two, three, four older Mac Pros just sitting there. I usually tell them that's your free hardware to run Axel on because it, it does a great job and is way more powerful than any Mac Mini or iMac. Uh, it, they do need to be upgraded to Yosemite or higher, and we recommend an SSD boot disk. But other than that, uh, you know, everything's uh, really good with those machines. And of course, if you have the money, the new Mac Pros are great, uh, and they have more of a life going forward. One issue with the older Macs is you don't know for how many years Apple is going to continue supporting them under OS X, although they've been pretty good about it. You know, there are still uh, Mac Pros going back to, uh, you know, 2010, 2011 that are still uh, supported under, under the latest OS releases. But you can definitely see the trend. They, they tend to go five or six years back, but not like 10 years. So if, if you were starting today and you want, want to kind of engineer for the future, uh, you probably want to use Mac Pros. And we have some guidelines for that. But, but the more cores, the better, pretty much. What a number of our bigger customers are actually doing is they're getting the Sonnet rack mount units and putting two Mac Pros in for you of rack space. Um, in that situation, you probably only need six or eight cores on each machine, though you can go as high as 12. Um, it, it's by far the best solution, but as you can imagine, it can add up to some serious money, uh, you know, over $10,000 in some cases, just for the hardware to run it on. So with that, I think we're going to switch back to the discussion topics. Um, and I haven't had a chance to look at questions, but I imagine there are uh, a bunch of questions that have come in uh, during this last segment. Um, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the basics of 10 gigabit and, uh, and what, what workflows make sense. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already, but I thought it would be good to highlight uh, why 10 gigabit as opposed to some other high-speed connection standards that you may be aware of? And uh, I don't know, Corky, if you want to weigh in on this, but the big ones that you hear about are, of course, Fiber Channel, which is more of a legacy SAN specification uh, for block-level transfers. And then you hear well, people saying, well, why can't I just network Thunderbolt? So, um, Corky, any, any uh, wisdom to impart on that? Well, I can talk. Whether it's wisdom or not, that's not that, that's what you decide. Um, okay. I'll, just, I'll make a couple quick comments. Um, uh, obviously, 40 gigabit Ethernet is where things are going. Um, depending upon the, the storage that's behind that that you're trying to talk to, 
Um, you might not get full bandwidth out of that, but I think the vendors are going to take care of that. Um, 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, is, you know, has been out there a very long time. It's very solid and stable. Thunderbolt is evolving. Uh, you know, Thunderbolt 3 coming out to support 40 gigabit uh, is, you know, trying to keep along, keep that moving forward. Um, you're always going to have the the issue of trying to communicate uh, longer than. Um, you know, the devices in a Thunderbolt uh, connection will allow you to. And also, uh, Thunderbolt always reserves some amount of bandwidth for displays. So uh, you don't get the same amount of bandwidth even on, a, on Thunderbolt 2 as you will get over 10 gigabit Ethernet. Um, fiber channel, um, block level always beats, um, beats uh, Ethernet at a, at a particular efficiency level, but um, Fiber channel can be more expensive, and you know one of the things I like to say when I'm at NEB is, you know, if you have a if you have an Ethernet connection and you're going to connect to another Ethernet connection, when do you worry about interoperability between companies? And, and you just don't. And fiber channel um, is sometimes a little bit more touchy. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not against that. I just think uh, that uh, Ethernet has got well, I'll put it this way. The last time I looked, and these are my competitors, there was about 39 companies that were trying to sell shared storage that were based was based on Ethernet, and one one company that was trying to sell you shared storage based on fiber channel. Um, there, there's a lot of economies of scale that go in that allow you to be a little bit uh, more uh, competitively priced if you're on a 10 if you're on an Ethernet and specifically 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, based interconnection uh, solution. Yeah, the thing I would add also about fiber channel at, at, at this point, there are definitely good uses for it, especially in very high-end post. Um, but it's it's a fairly crude instrument because it's block level, which means that you don't have a file system, you don't have all the safeguards of a network protocol sitting between you and the file system. It's almost like you're getting raw blocks of bits straight off your storage, and that's where you need really good uh, management software, or something you know, like uh, let's say the, the Quantum Store Next, which is the, the most common out there. Um, but it it is it's basically a uh, what's the right word for it? It's a bare metal kind of setup, and you typically need to have an administrator who understands SANS and 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 does a little bit of babysitting. Whereas the advantage of NAS, especially with 10 and 40 gigabit coming along, is that you don't have to be a guru. You, you just connect it up the same way you connect any other network storage. It's an SMB mount or an NFS mount. Um, you can even use AFP, even though it's going out of style, obviously. You can use AFP on, on many of these networks. And uh, it just works, right? You just do a mount from your desktop on the Mac. So while Fiber Channel makes sense in, in uh, certain high-end applications where you need the ultimate speed, uh, it's like asking the question, you know, do you really need a Ferrari to go to the grocery store in some cases? Hmm. Um, uh, Sam, we got a question here from Glenn who asked me about uh, a small tree implemented uh, J2K lossless uh, for storage and IO optimization, and I'm I'm afraid I have to say I don't know for sure. I can answer that. So, so well, it's not really your job. It's more our job. So, I mean, J2K lossless is, is a compression format for, for archival uh, saving of files. Um, Axel does support it uh, after a fashion, but we don't, we don't tell people what file formats to use. So if our customers want to use J2K lossless, they can. Um, I know that we've been able to generate proxies from J2K files uh, using our Axel Gear configuration. Um, one thing is when you get into these more high-end formats, it's usually important to test before you just assume that everything's going to work. So, Glenn, I would say send us an example of those files and we'll tell you if we can handle them or not. But what we don't do is, is prescribe it or, or force a workflow with J2K. So you could have a mix of J2K, ProRes, MXF, OP1A, you know, XDCAM, whatever formats you're comfortable with, you, you use those on our system, and we're just going to follow what's going on on the storage and make proxies wherever possible. Um, so in that sense, small tree doesn't care because they're just a network protocol, and we don't care because we're just watching. Uh, but that's a little bit too cavalier because 
especially on the Axel side, obviously you would want to have previews of those J2K files. Well, yeah, and I feel better now because this really wasn't a networking question. We no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Let it go, yeah. Glenn, but <laughs> I, I will say that Qualtry spends a ton of time optimizing uh, I.O. transfers across the network. So uh, given once the data is presented to us, we work very hard to make sure it rocks for you. Great. All right, let's go to the next. Oops. Um, um, okay, another another topic I want to kick off here is where does 10 gigabit make sense? Uh, you know, do you need to deploy it everywhere? Is it an all or nothing proposition, or can you be selective about it? And I think folks probably know where this is going, but the answer is very much that you can be selective about it. And and let's just talk about some examples. In fact, we had one of the questions earlier was how do you do a migration? from 1 gigabit to 10 gig gigabit? And the answer is you do it gradually. You need to have at least one switch in your network that will support 10 gigabit. Um, but for instance, just as back in the days of uh, 100 megabit networking, there were switches that had a handful of gigabit ports and the rest were all 100 uh, megabit. Nowadays, there are very affordable switches where there'll be like 24 ports of giggy and two or four ports of 10 giggy. And those switches often just cost a little bit more than a regular gigabit switch. Um, what's become interesting in the last year or two is that, especially with guys like Netgear, you will see switches that can do 8 or 16 ports of 10 gig coming down to the cost of what a 1 gig switch would have been not long ago, like under a thousand bucks, for instance. I know Netgear has uh, an 8 port switch. Uh, 708 or whatever, you know, it's like 795 from B&H. Uh, so, so you can you can set up a 10 gigabit network very easily, and all of the all of the connections to and from that switch can be a dynamic decision as to whether they need to be 10 gig or could still be one gig. So, to that point, um, where does it make sense to do 10 gig? Obviously, if you have a 4K editing workstation. Or if you have an HD workstation with a lot of streams, uh, if you have a you know a, a, a DPX uh, uh, sort of effects workflow, or you're using DaVinci, uh, those those obviously uh, make a lot of sense for 10 gig. Transcode engines make a lot of sense for for 10 gig. We just did an install with Smalltree uh, at at a, a new shop in New York. Um, they had a few dozen heavy users on the system, uh, but those are, are all staying one gigabit to the desktop for the most part. And uh, the key was that they had a big transcode engine with 12 cores. That thing to have optimal access to the shared storage, we put that on 10 gigabit. And then archive systems, a lot of times, because of LTO7 being so fast, LTO7 uh, tape drives can, can do upwards of 300 megabytes a second. And to feed those uh, at anything like their rated speed, uh, one, one gigabit networks will not be fast enough. So you, you're going to want 10 gigabit to go to your archive system in many cases. Um, and, and I probably should have mentioned it here, but it, maybe it goes without saying. The storage itself is like your, your high-speed editing storage, uh, whether it's small trees or somebody else's. That's the number one place to have 10 gigabit. So if there was only one thing in your network, that had 10 gigabit and everything else was 1 gigabit, it should be the storage. And then you move outwards from the storage and these items here like you know your faster workstations, your transcoding, your archiving, those come next. But a, a very common configuration would be uh, similar to the one we just did uh, together where a couple dozen people are still on gigabit and then maybe a half dozen stations at most are on 10 gigabit. And those can all feed into the same switch because the protocols are identical. Uh, you know, if you were to sniff what's going on on the wire on 10 gigabit, it's the exact same packets. It's TCP. It's all all the things in the network stack that used to exist on one gigabit, they're just happening 10 times faster. So there's no new protocols to deal with. It's it's not like going from uh, gigabit to fiber channel or something like that. Yeah, let me let me just add that the the price points for 10 gigabit Ethernet are coming down. To the point that uh, you know, uh, I always spend time looking for uh, the best price performance point uh, for my customers, and 
uh, you know, it's 10 times the performance for basically two times the cost or a little, little bit less than two times the cost now. So, you know, it's a, it's a significant upgrade for not a significant amount of dollars. So whenever possible, we always try and steer our customers to be putting in 10 gigabit Ethernet it just because it just future proofs uh, their their uh, solution. Yeah, and actually, one thing I, I can mention as well that kind of surprised me was that the dual port small tree 10 gig card cost like a hundred bucks more than the single port. Like it was like 595 and 695 or something. So there's almost no reason not to go with the dual and get twice the bandwidth. Uh, you could either do twice the bandwidth by doing you know trunking, uh, you know, or you could conceivably have the same machine on two 10 gigabit networks uh, or at two 10 gigabit addresses for different functions. So um, at, at those kinds of prices, it, it really is attractive to think about 20 gigabit in a way because what's 20 gigabit? It's two 10 gigabit ports on the same machine uh, and, and you'll, you're not going to get double the throughput, but you'll probably get in the real world, I don't know, 1.6, 1.7 times the throughput. Corky, what would you say? Yeah, I I have a I have a word picture story. Um, you know, if you have two ports, you basically can look at it as going from a single lane to a two lane. Uh, both lanes are, are traveling at the same rate, but now you're moving twice the data from the server out to to be served by your uh, your network. So um, you can get you can get close in in that environment where you're just having two different connections. You can get close to double the throughput. I'd say it's closer to one nine five. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Of course, you have to have a machine with uh, the horsepower to handle all the packets, but but anything yeah. in the Mac Pro anything in the Mac Pro class could definitely do that. Yep. Yeah. Do you find that on the smaller Macs with Thunderbolt that um, they have trouble handling the the dual ports, or or could you even go down to like a Mac Mini or an iMac? You know, I haven't gotten a lot of feedback from customers saying that the Thunderbolt doesn't doesn't do that. I mean, um, obviously these things get very case sensitive as to what the customer is trying to do. Um, my experience has been that you know the Thunderbolt's going to do what Thunderbolt's capable of doing, as well as Gigabit's going to do what Gigabit's capable of doing, and it ends up being something else in the system. So I wouldn't say Thunderbolt can't do it, but maybe the processor can't do. Um, a rendering environment s scenario because it it doesn't have enough juice or there's not enough memory to kind of keep the keep the pipe fully fed. Um, so there's a, there's a there's a bottleneck somewhere in the system, but I don't think it's really Thunderbolt. It ends up being as you get smaller or go to the lower end CPUs and configurations in the in the product line, you you just start running out of oomph to just kind kind of drive the packets at full rate. Makes sense. All right, and I have this slide on where not to use uh, 10 gigabit. Um, so, in our case, as I mentioned, you know, for basic workstation, if someone's handling a couple of streams of HD, they can absolutely do that over regular gigabit. Um, you know, or at most maybe a couple of ports of gigabit. You don't need 10 gigabit for that kind of workflow. Um, and obviously, for utility machines or graphic designers. Uh, you're not going to need it either. Um, but as you move up the scale in terms of number of streams and, and the bandwidth of each stream or people using uncompressed, that starts to make sense. Um, Axel itself, the database, the web server, um, really doesn't need uh, anything more than gigabit Ethernet because its main job is to hold the database of all your assets, uh, the metadata associated with those assets, uh, and, for instance, to do things like uh, uh, holding the proxies, unless you move that outboard. But even if you do move that outboard onto a NAS, the bandwidth for each of the proxy streams is only one megabit per second by default. So, you know, no matter, even if you have 20 streams, let's say, that's still 20 megabits a second. Um, that's not going to get anywhere near uh, what you could do with, with the gigabit Ethernet uh, uh, connector. So, I, I think. For, for most of those mainstream applications, you're not going to need 10 gig. Corky, any any uh, thoughts to provide on on that question about sort of when 10 gigabit is overkill? I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, 
if if the if the format you're trying to um, edit in doesn't require more bandwidth, um, then I think you're fine with Ethernet. You know, and as you explained, Axel product is not going to be based upon that bandwidth, anyways. Um, you know, our recommendation to customers is um, um, until un unless they see the need that they're going to be moving to you know 4K work or um, trying to uh, you know, drive a higher amount of uh, clients, um, there's really not a, a huge benefit. You know, if they're if they're doing ProRes, you know, four four four. So it's it really kind of it gets back to being unique to the customer's configuration. Which is why, um, you know, we always ask people to to call us when they're when they're trying to put together their shared storage solution, because we'll we'll make sure that we tailor the the networking uh, that they're looking at to you know provide a good match to the to the environment they're trying to be working in. Makes sense. Um, all right. Well, we've been getting some really good questions coming in. I think we've been keeping up. Um, uh, here's a question here, uh, also from Glenn. Does Axel or Smalltree offer transcode or metadata toolset plugins rather than having to use third-party systems that drive the overall costs higher? That is actually an excellent question. It's probably more an Axel question than a Smalltree one. So up until now, um, our main go-to transcoder has been Telestream Episode Pro or Episode Engine. And uh, we're, we're going right to the bitter end with that because Telestream has announced end of life for that in February of next year. But it's a great product at a really excellent price. I mean, uh, Episode Pro is, I don't know, close to $1,000. Episode Engine is about $6,000. And the bang for the buck is tremendous. So I would encourage anybody that needs to do a lot of transcoding to consider buying an Episode uh, Pro or Engine license before they go away. Uh, and we're even negotiating a kind of last time buy with Telestream. But, but the sad fact is that software, once it's no longer maintained, uh, you know, it's a little bit like rotting bananas. It starts to lose its value pretty quickly. So, I, you know, I, w I won't make the same recommendation six months from now. Uh, I will say that in the last few releases, they've gotten Episode Pro to a really robust point, and 7.2 uh, essentially fixes all the, the remaining niggling complaints we had with with even 7.0 and 7.1, which at, at 64 bits was already a big step up from the previous one. So it's kind of a shame that you know they finally got it right, and now they're killing it because they'd much rather promote Vantage. Um, it's, it, it's a sad thing. But meanwhile, we've been working for some months on a strategy that would allow us to kind of take charge of our destiny. Um, out of our 370 customers out there, Probably about half of them have, have got an episode, and so we're going to need to migrate them over the next year or so to something better. Uh, and what, we, what we're going to be doing is, is basically a transcode framework, uh, a distributed uh, multi-platform framework that will let us farm out transcode processes uh, to, to additional machines, could be Macs, could be PCs, maybe even Linux. Um, and we'll be able to call whatever transcoders are available on that platform. So you can think of it as a coordination tool. It's not going to be a transcoder itself, although with, with FFmpeg it, it'll it'll serve in that role. But but you know there are transcoders out there like Adobe Media Encoder, like Apple Compressor, Episode, which as I say will still be around for a number of years, at least uh, for for a lot of very good workflows. Um, and and who knows what else as the market starts to open up. So what we want to do is build the framework and then let people kind of have best of breed, uh, especially when it comes to newer formats like some of the 4K camera formats or J2K, where your average run of the mill transcoder may not be able to handle it. So we think that that transcoding framework is going to have a lot of value. And uh, for starters, it'll work with FFmpeg and Episode Pro. But uh, when we announce it, and, and it, it'll likely be at NAB next year, uh, there will probably be other transcode, transcoders supported uh, from the outset. So I hope that makes sense. Um, our goal is really just to empower our customers and not cost them a lot of money because we don't think it's necessary to go to big expensive transcode platforms uh, to, to get these, these very basic jobs done. 
And for a lot of the work that our customers are doing, the cloud is in an appropriate place because they've got all their stuff on their storage locally. And so uploading it to the cloud just to transcode it and bring it back, uh, you know, and of course pay uh, the, the SaaS service fees for that um, is, is not yet compelling, I would say. Uh, it's starting to get very interesting, and maybe that will be part of our mix uh, going forward as well. But, but long answer to a short question, but hope that uh, that covers uh, what you were looking for before, Glenn. So at this point, this is kind of the formal Q&A section uh, of the call. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. And, and if there aren't more questions, I could also do just a brief five-minute demo of our latest version, Axel 2016.3. Uh, so um, before I do that, let me just put up the contact info for me and Corky. And I just want to emphasize that, as you can tell from the informal style of this presentation, uh, we, we not only uh, would like you to contact us, we really expect it. And, and many of you I already know, uh, you know, met you at NAB or, or in various contexts. So uh, don't hesitate to pick up the, the phone. I do, I do find like Corky and I are a little bit old fashioned that way. Like everybody else like wants to get, an, you know, I don't know, tweeted at or get a question on social media or what have you. Um, we might spot those, we might not, but we will definitely respond if you just call us, right? We'll pick up the phone and we can, we're can. we happy to discuss uh, your needs in, in, in uh, gory detail. Um, okay, one more question just came in from Tim Vincent. Uh, what if you already have an enterprise transcoder like Vantage? Can it be used for Axle? So that's a good question. Today, it can be used in certain ways, but not others. Um, we have very good integration, for instance, with FSMPEG, an episode where we can track the percentage complete on a transcode when it's transcoding a high-res uh, original to a proxy. With Vantage, you can set up a workflow where Vantage will make your proxies and you can bring those into Axle, but you won't get the little progress bar that tells you how complete it is. And you won't get a feedback error if it couldn't transcode the clip, for instance. So episode will work with Axle because it works off the file system and you can use watch folders. But the level of integration that goes beyond that and really gives you a live update is not yet there for Vantage or, or really anything besides FSMPEG and Episode. And that's one of the reasons that we're developing this distributed framework is so that we can broaden that list, hopefully to include Vantage, um, because we are seeing, of course, plenty of Vantage out there. People have made big investments in it, and it's, it's a pretty powerful system, so we would love to support it. But our first priority I mean, actually, uh, Telestream was asking us how soon we could support Vantage. And I said, well, it's going to happen later than it would have because we've got to replace Episode first. <laughs> um, I think they thought it would be the other way, like when Episode went away, we would just jump on Vantage. But because of its price point, you know, Vantage is typically ten to $40,000. Uh, for our customers who might not even spend that much on their whole media management system, uh, Vantage is not a very cost-effective way to just uh, transcode proxies. Uh, but we know we know it's out there in large numbers, and and we will find a way to support it uh, more closely than we do now. Okay, with that, I think I'm going to just uh, wrap this up with a quick demo. But uh, again, more more questions are also welcome. Not. So I don't see anything new in the queue. Sorry. I Sam, I don't see anything new in the queue. So I think. Uh, yeah, I know. I think I think we can we can jump to the to the demo. Sure. So can everybody see my screen? Or not yet. I guess you're, you're still seeing the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see the um, login. Oh, you see the login page. Okay, good. Then we're where we need to be. So I'm just going to log in to Axel 2016.3. Uh, it's a little slow because it's running on my laptop along with about 30 other apps. Um, so uh, anyway, this is what the user interface looks like. And basically, it's a representation of what's on my file system. So these folders that you see, these are all actual folders. And if I create another folder in my file system, it's just going to show up here. Uh, a number of videos are obviously visible. As soon as Axel sees 
an object, it's going to make a preview. So for instance, here's a Photoshop file, a PSD, it's actually a screenshot. We click on that, it's just a, a low res of that screenshot. Uh, but more importantly for videos, you know, this is an interview, for instance, with the customer of ours. If I go into it, um, this is our player, and it's, it's an H.264, one megabit per second uh, stream. I can play, uh, I can scrub, so I can scrub in the timeline. Um, also, you'll see these comments come up. Basically, at various points in the timeline, people have already put down these comments, and I could do one here. And I can also hit, just hit play. And we support the J, K, and L keys. So, I don't know if you can hear the audio in the background. The video may be a little bit jumpy because, uh, of course, you'll be uh, getting that through Go to Go to Webinar. And if you want to see this in, in better form, you, you can obviously go to our website. But I will tell you that the H.264s are really good quality, uh, considering they're just one megabit. For instance, I'll expand this to full screen, and you'll get a feeling for the uh, for the resolution. It's certainly nothing you'd want to broadcast, but it's good enough that you can review the material, do approvals, and, and so forth. And uh, to just show you, like, suppose I wanted to comment on, on his hand gesture or something. So I can just um, put down a comment like uh, hand gesture. And I'll post it. So that will go at the point in the timeline where we are right now. So there's hand gesture. And it just shows those in sequence below the clip. Now, in addition to the metadata that you can put on the timeline, there's also metadata of essentially custom fields that you can do on the right. And so these can be any combination of checkboxes, of drop-down lists. Um, we have big text boxes. This is a new type of field for us, so you can just paste in like a whole Word doc if you want, if you have a transcript of, of what's said. Um, we also have date fields, so I can click on the date field and then select the date. Um, and little buttons. So a whole bunch of different metadata types. And in the administrative section, that's where you kind of create these. But you don't have to know any command line stuff. It's, it's all very user friendly uh, by, by design. There's also an approval button here so you can approve material. Um, and we have you know, stuff like if I go back out to the uh, folder view, uh, we have a grid view and a list view that you can toggle between. So as I go back out here, um, I can just switch to the list view, for instance. And in the list view, you can specify additional fields, like the videographer or the producer name, that will come up uh, to the right of the standard fields. I'll just briefly touch on the administrative stuff to give you a feel for it. Obviously, uh, we don't want to get too deep into the weeds here. But, uh, but basically, what the admin section of Axel does is it lets you point it at certain volumes on your network, uh, which we call catalogs. So the admin section will basically create um, links to those catalogs. And then on the left side, where you see these folders, these are the top-level catalogs uh, that, it's, that it's accessing. It's like my computer is very slow right here, so I'm not sure we're going to want to hang it up too much. Let's try that again. I may have literally too many things running on my Mac. But take my word for it. Oh, wait, here we go. <laughs> There's the admin section. OK. Boy, that is about the slowest I've ever seen my computer. Um, if you have this on a proper network server like a Mac Pro, that you click that button and the admin section comes up immediately, not uh, 30 seconds later. Too many applications up. Um, so um, by the way, Cruise is a very interesting, this Cruise thing is a very interesting multi-window browser app that I got from the App Store, and I recommend it highly. If you're the kind of person that likes to have too many tabs open in your browser, uh, check out Cruise. It's pretty cool. But I'm going to quit it right now because it's getting in the way of my demo. Um, so this is where you set up the users in the system, and each user, as I've mentioned, can have very specific access to a folder path. Um, Obviously, for the admin, the admin has access to everything. And you'll see on the right here that on a per folder basis, you can have really granular permissions. So for instance, I set up this user called Sam. Sam can only see the GoPro footage from the game, and he can only see previews and post comments. He can't download files or approve or do anything. So you can get really granular. And as I mentioned before, you can also customize the logo that that user sees when they log in. 
The next tab in the admin section is where you set up the catalogs. So here I have two catalogs, but on a network setup, you might have multiple catalogs. You literally just point Axel at the volumes you have. If there are 100 terabyte volumes, it might take it a couple of weeks to crank all the way through them, but it's going to basically go and make previews of everything it can make previews of. And if it can't make a preview, those files are just going to show up as icons in the desktop. But you can still tag them with metadata. The data fields, as I mentioned before, this is where you customize the metadata setup so that the fields we were just looking at are here. You know, this is the drop down list. It makes a drop down menu and you give it values. Um, the uh, transcript box is a text large, so it's just a, but I could change that field to a smaller text box if I just wanted, uh, you know, a few words in there. And you can specify the sort order of the field, so how they display in the user interface. So it's, it's pretty, pretty slick that way. Um, and you can also filter incoming metadata from EXIF, IPTC, XMP. Um, one very cool new thing we have in Excel 2016 is if you get the gear version, you can now bring in XMP metadata into the custom field. So if you're using Adobe Prelude or Premiere to do some tagging up front in the field, when those clips come in, Axel will not only read the XMP, which it already did before, but it'll put that XMP into the custom fields that you specify. And that can be pretty slick for like a, a two-step tagging workflow where some of it's done on set and then the rest of it is done back in the editing facility. There are some appearance settings. For instance, I was just doing a demo for Bank of America, but I could just as easily call this a webinar demo. And that's just what will appear at the top of the tab uh, when you log in. Um, and uh, so I've just saved that, and, and so that, that will become the tab. And then some advanced stuff like how you want to generate your proxies and uh, email settings for notifications. Axel can send out notifications uh, for uh, various events in the system. So I'll just go out of admin here and go back to my main user interface. As you can see, it now says webinar demo, followed by the, uh, the uh, catalog that we're on. And uh, there's nothing in media too. Um, I haven't talked about bins and smart filters and archives, uh, but ever so briefly, bins are how you send things to your editors, whether it's in FCP 7, X, or Premiere. And we are working on something with Avid, but nothing to announce yet. Smart filters are saved searches, so you can have a number of saved searches uh, where you just type in a search in the search box using Google-style syntax or actually our drop-down list, and then those that search criteria those search criteria can be saved as a smart filter uh, and, and reissued later. And then finally, archives, where we list the uh, either disk or tape archives that you can push stuff out to. So uh, I think we are at the end of our 90 minutes, and that is probably the quickest Axel demo I've ever given. But uh, when I there are a few questions like, you might want to take a look at uh, quickly. Then. All right, well, and we can we can stay on the line. You know, if people have more questions. Obviously, we hit our schedule time, so I don't want to uh, I don't want to overstay our welcome. But yeah, let's stay on the line and answer questions and and uh, shoot the breeze if people are interested. But mostly, thank you all for joining us. It was really a great turnout, and uh, I know so close to the holidays, people have lots of things they'd like to be doing. So uh, thanks again for joining us, and hopefully, it's in uh, informative. I will say, to my way of thinking, we should do another one of these uh, in the spring because I think there's a lot of interest around 10 gigabit and, and high-speed networking in general. And uh, for instance, if we were to focus on something as practical as the different connector and cabling options, I think that would really help a lot of people feel confident enough uh, to go ahead and do this stuff. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And we will now go to answering questions. Uh, and in fact, what I will also do is put back up our contact info for those that need it. So give me just one moment. All right, so that's, that's me and Corky for, for them that need it. And, uh, okay, back to questions. What have we got? Well, there were several so, that talked about Axel uh, solutions. I think uh, Curtis Wilcox asked questions about, uh, does Axel have any features for managing captions or subtitle files associated with video assets? Good question. So we have XML import. And what that means is that if you can convert your caption information into an XML, 
we can bring it in. That's not just the uh, tagging metadata, it's also the timeline metadata. So you could, for instance, convert each caption to a comment in the timeline and have those play out in, in the uh, lower third just the way our, our comment section does now. It's not true subtitling. This is never going to be a, a broadcast-oriented subtitling system. But if you just wanted a, a, a good handle on what subtitles or what text is being said where, uh, just using our XML import would be a good way to do that. And we do have really good guys on staff that can help you write what are called XSLTs, XML translators. So if your subtitling system will put out a readable uh, XML of some kind, we can almost always find a way to import it. Let's see, other questions. Oh, uh, um, uh, here's, here's one. Is, is Sanbay Systems going away by NAS system? That is a very good question from uh, Jason Wee. So I would say, I mean, and, and I'll, I'll ask Corky his opinion, my feeling is not that they're going away, but that SANs have stopped growing. Like the SAN market, particularly with 10 gigabit and now 40 gigabit coming on, there is less and less reason to buy a traditional fiber channel SAN. So it's, it's, it's being crowded up to the top of the market with 4K and 8K work. And even in, even 4K, uh, in many cases, is doable with 10 gigabit clients. So you really have to look hard to find situations that must be SAN, and then the extra cost and complexity of the SAN pushes you back in the direction of NAS. But what would you say, Corky? Well, that was really good, uh, Sam. I was <clears throat> going to make the comment that uh, uh, basically SANs are what people perceive as fiber channel connected solutions, and NAS are what people refer to as uh, Ethernet uh, connected solutions. So uh, they're both around, but um, um, NASs are becoming more popular because 10 gigabit now gives you fiber channel like performance in a uh, less complicated environment. Yep, yep, totally agree. So I have a question here, do you have a panel that lives inside Premiere? I thought I would just bring this up. This is our new Premiere panel. Uh, it's downloadable for free from the Adobe, uh, I think they don't call it the App Store, but the Creative Cloud uh, plugin, what you call it. And uh, basically, you just if you're, if you're an Axel owner, you just get this, and it, it piggybacks on your existing license. So there's no extra charge for it. Uh, all of our existing users that are on support, by the way, got this for free. We really like to make it uh, a perk, you know, that as we introduce new features wherever possible, uh, they're part of the annual maintenance uh, rather than something you have to pay extra for. So in, in the case of the, the panel, what you get is it's a search box that echoes the search capabilities in the main Axel UI, and then you have folders which you can navigate and bins. So all of this echoes what's going on in Axel, but then you can directly export things into your timeline. I'm probably going to need to log out and log back in. Let me just log out here and log back in. Because, uh, So essentially, I can go into uh, one of these uh, catalogs here, and here are a bunch of clips, and I can say, okay, I want to bring, uh, you know, either an image or or a clip in. I select it, and I say import selected, and that brings it into Premiere. And here I have the panel floating above Premiere, but I can also I forget how you do it. I think you just drag it from here, or you uh, forget how you drag it into the. I think it's like that. There we go drag it into Premiere. So it's, it's really nice and, and it's available for Mac and PC. It works equally well on both and we even handle things like the uh, Mac and PC uh, path mappings, right, because the, the forward slashes become back slashes and there's some issue with where the root volume is located um, on the PC. We, we handle all of that transparently inside Axle so that whether you're using a Mac or a PC workstation, you'll be able to use this panel and of course, we already handle it well through the browser. So Chrome runs equally well on both. Firefox runs equally well on both. And we even support uh, IE and the, and the new Edge browser a bit. So, um, I, but I'd say 90% of our customers are either using Chrome or Safari for the browser access. And, and Chrome is what we recommend on PCs. Um, another question from Glenn. Can Axel's metadata follow a standardized template like AS11 or AS02? Um, you could do that with an XSLT, but in general, um, I'd say our, our customers are using a lot less metadata. You know, AS11, for instance, 
has, I think, 85 standard fields. And if you put 85 fields into Axle, they're all there on the right. You would you'd be scrolling for a while. Um, so in general, the uses of the system are not in, in that kind of enterprise um, archival use and much more for kind of work in progress, people just making comments on stuff. We, we recommend a maximum of 10 to 20 fields simply because, A, nobody's going to want to scroll that far. But B, even with systems that are designed for it, it's been my experience, and this goes all the way up to Blue Order, which is now Interplay MAM, uh, and, and systems like Cat TV. Once you get above about a dozen fields, nobody fills them in. I know that sounds really uh, sarcastic, but it's just, at least in our environments, obviously in a true broadcast environment where you need AS11 and you're going to air and, and the BBC insists that you fill out all 85 fields, you're going to do that, right? If it's high quality, long form work, it's worth taking the time to fill out 85 fields. But for everybody else, it's just going to scare them away and they're not going to use the system. So that's kind of our difference. That doesn't mean that we couldn't support a bigger data set or support those workflows. But in general, our world is one where uh, there, there are people who have like really short attention spans and they're trying to get stuff done. So it, it becomes prohibitive. Uh, here's a question from uh, Tom Truco. Uh, is the main in the main catalog view, can you select multiple folders, files, and apply common metadata in one shot? Yes. So you, we absolutely have a select all followed by edit metadata, and uh, you, can, you can select the entire, uh, you know, contents of what you can see, do select all, or you can select individual files and edit the metadata just, just on those. You can also do selective, you know, within those, you can edit only certain fields. And for the fields that are already populated or somewhat populated, it shows a dot, 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 in the layout. In fact, what I may do, I can switch back to my. Uh, I'll see if we have time to demo that, but for now, I'll take my word for it. Um, let's see. And that metadata is applied recursively. Ah, we don't yet have it where it applies it recursively through the contents below those folders. I don't know if our product manager, Patrice, is still on the line. He was on earlier. I know that's something they've been working on where you could like select the top level folder and it would ripple down no. all of the contents of that folder. Hi Patrice. Hello. So so do we, we don't yet have a feature where you can just edit the metadata at a top level and have it ripple, do we? No, this is something we are actually working on for multiple reasons actually. So uh, right now each item you see in the browser will actually be the uh, an object and uh, so each object will have the possibility to have an action to it, including folders. So what we are trying to do is actually make sure that we pick up the files that are contained in this folder for multiple workflows, such as restoring from a folder, archive files, regenerating the proxies in the whole folders, or populating the metadata. However, as it stands right now, if you select a folder and tag metadata to it, and you perform a search into Axel, this folder is going to show up as a search result. And when you click on it, what you will be able to browse and see the content of this folder which relates to the search that you have done. But Sam is absolutely right that as we are looking into ways to uh, append metadata down to the, to the files that belong to this folder. And let me just show that select all function. So here we are in a folder full of footage. Basically, I can I can just go up here and say select all, and then the edit metadata button will be available on the right. And I could deselect a couple, right? I could deselect these three. And I say edit here. What happens is if there's already metadata in some of these, it shows as a dot, dot, dot. So maybe I don't want to mess with those, but none of them have the videographer field filled out, so I'll just put spam. And then basically I can go in, having saved that, I can go in and click on one of these and the videographer will be listed as Sam. So uh, that's part of what you wanted, but we don't yet have the ripple down through the folder structure thing, although admittedly that would be pretty cool. Um, and uh, so good questions. Um, here's another question. Could you highlight differences between Axel and Keyflow Pro? Absolutely. So Keyflow Pro is a very interesting app that's more of a single user going on small workgroup app. It's a local client. So Axel really doesn't have a client application at all. It's all through the browser or through plugins. 
there, it, there's no local application that's machine specific. This makes us basically portable, so you can run it from Macs, from PCs, even from uh, you know high-end Linux machines running DaVinci. But Keyflow Pro is a Mac application, uh, and it's designed primarily for single user access, although you can, I believe, share out with other uh, handfuls of people in your immediate network. Um, so I'd, I'd put it as somewhere between, if you look at what Adobe Bridge does, uh, I'd say Keyflow Pro is, is more optimized for video, uh, but is, is probably halfway to Adobe Bridge in terms of being single user versus multi-user, whereas what we're doing is really trying to address the needs of work groups starting with the immediate edit stations and extending out to people on mobile devices, uh, assistant editors, producers, who, who may not even be connected to the storage. It's a really different uh, worldview. Um, I think, uh, oh, one last question that I'll cover and I think we're ready to go. People have a lot of the sort of thanks and signing off messages, but that's, that's great. Um, how well does Axel work with Final Cut Pro 10? So, it works really well. Basically, what we let you do with FCPX is you can create bins in Axel, and then you can export those bins via XML to FCPX and also FCP7 for backwards compatibility. So we, we've tested it all the way through the current uh, 10.3. Um, it uses the same XML uh, that they've supported going back to 10.1. And so basically, if I say create FCP 10.1 XML, it's going to download to my desktop in XML. And then if I open that XML in Final Cut, it will bring up the subclips that I've selected here. Now, we are very interested. I, I've been hearing more and more good stuff happening around Final Cut Pro 10 in the last six months. Um, Colin, uh, who's our U.S. sales director, and I went out to the Final Cut Pro 10 Summit at Cupertino a month ago. And I have to say, they're, they're making big strides with that product. It's really interesting. They finally have audio tracks again although they call them lanes just because they have to do everything differently. But basically, it's, it's finally getting to the point where you could do professional-grade work on it again. And, and I know, you know there are people that have been doing that all along, but I think it's becoming more mainstream in its appeal, and the performance is, is awesome. So you know, Premiere tends to struggle with 4K and tends to struggle with long sequences. Uh, Final Cut Pro 10 seems to really have an edge on that stuff, and now that they've worked out a lot of the quirks and limitations with the UI, we think it's going to be a, a real player in the next couple of years. So we are looking to do something similar to what we've done with the Premiere panel in FCPX, possibly including two-way metadata transfer. So if you have any specific requests on that or things you'd like to see, let us know. Uh, FCPX doesn't let you do panels per se, but you can write it what's called a companion app that will basically uh, uh, connect to it through through uh, Apple events and Apple scripts and so forth. So um, you, you have ways to talk to the app uh, that are not embedded panels. And, uh, and we're, we're definitely interested in pursuing that. So um, I think with that, we are going to call it. We're way over time. It's like more than 15 minutes over. So uh, let's see. I, I think uh, we're good. So thanks so much, everybody, for this extended pre-holiday session. And thank you so much, Corky, for, uh, for doing this. Um, I have the feeling we're going to be doing it again because, in a way, there's just as many questions out there that we didn't answer. But uh, let's, let's see what we can do to schedule something for Q1. And everybody, have a great holiday season and enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of the year. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, everybody, and uh, happy holidays. <laughs>